as many were astonished at you. His appearance was so marred, beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a dry a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The Lord shall prosper his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he, was po he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This particular passage found at the end of Isaiah chapter 52 and the whole of chapter 53. It comprises one of my favorite sections of scripture. You know, I've read this passage in Isaiah on Good Friday many times throughout my time as a believer, you know, throughout my, my tenure in ministry. I think probably almost every Good Friday message that I've ever done includes this passage of scripture from Isaiah. Because in this passage, it's such a clear and beautiful and devastating picture of our Messiah. And especially today on, on this Good Friday, on the day that we commemorate the death of our Lord, I want to reflect a few minutes on this passage. And I'm sure you've heard Isaiah 53 preached many times. You probably heard me preach on it several times if you attend this church. You know, we have talked both about what this passage meant for Jesus and what it means for us. But I think it's good for us to kind of go back and to review and to just kind of contemplate and meditate on this passage. And so 
this evening on this Good Friday, I want us as a, as a body of believers to stop and I want us to consider the words of Isaiah in all of its glory and all of its majesty and in all of its horror. I want to ponder the, the magnitude and the majesty of this situation for a moment. Picture in your mind, 2,000 years ago, our Lord Jesus, he's standing up there in the local synagogue in Galilee. He's got his, he's got his prayer shawl on. He's got his sandals on. You can imagine it's hot, it's dusty. He stands up there holding that, that great, probably the second half of Isaiah, because Isaiah was so long, it comprised several scrolls. He's standing up there and he begins to, to unfurl that scroll of the book of Isaiah. And he begins to read these great messianic texts concerning the impending suffering and, and death of the Messiah. And we've talked about this before, but, but I wonder how Jesus felt as he's standing up there reading aloud the suffering and the torture and ultimately the death that he was going to endure. I mean, imagine, imagine the stress of knowing what was coming. Imagine if you were Jesus and knowing that you were about to become sin, that you were about to be separated from the Father for the first time in all of eternity. Imagine knowing the, the physical horror of what was about to happen. What did Jesus think when he read these verses? <clears throat> His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. What did he think when he read that he was pierced for our transgressions and that he was crushed for our iniquities? Or verse six, that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, on the Christ, the iniquity of us all. What did he think as he gets to verse 10? When he says, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. Certainly, Jesus would have read through this passage and he would have known that it was written about him, right? Undoubtedly, Jesus is reading that and he understood that it was his own body that was going to be so abused that he didn't even look human anymore. As it says in, in 52.14, that he was beyond human semblance. He knew that he was the one that was going to be beaten so badly that his own disciples, probably even his own mother, wouldn't even be able to recognize his face. How did he feel when he read that he was going to be pierced by that coarse Roman spear? How did he feel when he, when he thought about those rough iron spikes being driven through his hands and feet, that he was going to be whipped, that he was going to be beaten? Was our Lord fearful? When he read that it was the will of the Father to crush him, that it was the will of his own Father to crush him, that the Lord was going to lay on him the iniquity of the whole world. Was he filled with dread? Was he filled with anxiety, with terror? I mean, think of 2 Corinthians 5.21. We alluded to it a moment ago. But Paul makes one of the most profound statements in all of Scripture. 
He says, for our sake, he, the Father, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let me read that again. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For my sake, and for your sake, God the Father made Jesus God the Son, the one who knew no sin, to become sin. Think of the gravity of that. The sin of all of humanity was placed upon Christ there on the cross that we might become the righteousness of God. It's almost beyond comprehension, isn't it? I mean, not almost. Right? It's completely beyond comprehension. Totally and, and thoroughly beyond our comprehension. Jesus became sin so that we could become righteousness. Scripture teaches that he took our sin, all of our sin, the sins of the whole world, the sins of all of humanity throughout all history, and he placed it upon Christ. And in return, in exchange for our sin, we are clothed in his righteousness. The righteousness of Christ. <coughs> his righteousness was placed upon us, a place on our shoulders like a robe. Remember there in the garden called Gethsemane, in the night that Jesus was betrayed? Remember he's there in the garden and he's anguishing. He's He's laboring in prayer. He's in such turmoil, it says they began to sweat great drops of blood. And remember when he cries out? He says, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus says, Father, if it's possible to remove the events that are about to transpire, if it's possible to stop those things from unfolding, right? if there's any other way to work out the salvation of humanity, let's do that, he says. Let's go that route. If there's any other path for the redemption of mankind that circumvents the cross, let's do that one. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Why was Jesus willing? Why was Jesus willing to die in our place? Why was Jesus willing to bear the sin of the world as he was nailed there on that Roman cross. I think Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 is enlightening in this regard. It says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Some of your translations say the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross, he says there, right? He despised the shame of it. But he endured the cross. Why? For the joy that was set before him. What joy is he talking about there? It's me. You guys, the joy of the salvation of lost men. Jesus died. Jesus went to the cross 
so that you and I could find new life in him. He died so that we can live. And that's the good news. That's the gospel message. Jesus, the perfect one. Jesus, God the Son. Jesus went to the cross and the Father poured out all of his wrath, the wrath that we deserve, the wrath that humanity deserves for breaking God's law. He poured it out on Christ on the cross. And Jesus accepted it willingly so that we might be saved, so that we could find new life in him. He did it willingly for the joy that is set before him. That's glorious, isn't it? He did it for you, and he did it for me. And on this Good Friday, as we remember what Jesus did for you and I, as we remember the pain and the suffering that our Lord went through on our behalf, right, in light of that, in light of the suffering, in light of the agony, in light of the death of Jesus on our behalf, how can we not respond with love towards him? How can we not desire to walk with him? How can we not surrender our whole lives to him in service? In just a second, Matt and the worship team are going to come back up. And we're going to share together in communion. And the communion stations are there on the sides. And as we continue in worship on this most holy of nights, there's no rush. You don't have to jump up and run to the front. Right? Allow a little space. Reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. Allow a little space for the Lord to speak to you and for the Holy Spirit to minister to you. And when you're ready, make your way forward. Make your way forward to commemorate the death of our Lord. Remember that his body was broken for us. Remember that his blood, the blood that poured from his hands and his feet and his head and from his side, Remember the blood that was shed so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be born again. Remember the blood that was shed so that we can have new life in him, so that we can be saved from the penalty of our sins. Amen. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are eternally grateful for your goodness and your mercy, and your loving kindness, Lord. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your body that was broken. We thank you for your blood that was shed. We thank you that you died so that we can find new life in you, Lord. We just pray that you would help us to, to walk worthy of the calling at which we've been called. Help us to seek after you, Lord. We pray that in your name, Jesus. Amen.